Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening. My name's Carl. I'm an alcoholic. Will I break anything if I move this down? There we go. There we go. All right. Thank you, Steve. And I enjoy our friendship, too. Mark, amazing. Good job. Spectacular. I'm, uh, it's an honor. And, and I bet you Don did a bunch of the work, don't you think? <laughs> That's what I think. That's what I think. See, the table of all the women who've done all the work are all applauding because Don did most of the work. And it's a privilege to be here. Uh, lots of my friends are here, people that I get to travel. I, this table right here, you never see them in their own hometown. I only get to see them in other parts of the, of the country. But it's a privilege to be here. I'm supposed to talk on steps one and two, and it's really the most important thing I can tell you about myself. The most important thing I can tell you about myself is that I'm an alcoholic. There's lots of other things that I aspire to be, that I try to be, that I have accomplished, that I do on a daily basis. But the most important thing about me is that I'm an alcoholic. It's the dominating factor of my life, drunk or sober. My sobriety date is January 21st, 1987. I'm 53 years old, so I've been an Alcoholics Anonymous sober for a little bit over half my life. And the most dominating feature or factor about my life is that I'm an alcoholic. It's been the decision maker, drunk or sober. And the reason I believe I'm an alcoholic is really very simple. It's not complicated at all. The reason I believe I'm an alcoholic is because I have a really strange relationship with alcohol. That's why I'm alcoholic. And the strange relationship that I have with alcohol takes on a few forms. The first part of this strange relationship that I have with alcohol happens when I drink it. A very strange thing happens when I drink booze. The book calls it an allergic reaction. And the book says that the symptom of this allergic reaction that I get when I drink alcohol is what they call the phenomenon of craving. I know. If you've been sober a long time right now, you're going, oh, is he really going to get into this phenomenon of craving and allergy to the body, obsession of mind? Yes, I'm going to. <laughs> and, I, and by the way, if you've been sober a long time, I'm not talking to you tonight. I'm talking to the new person that doesn't understand that. I remember the very first time that I figured that out, I was fairly new, and I was sitting in a meeting in San Diego, California, and my sponsor was right next to me, and my sponsor's sponsor was right next to, right next to him. And some old-timer in the meeting was telling the same story that I had heard at least 19 times, and I was only sober about 60 days. Now, the first time I heard it, it knocked me out of my chair. Just, whoa, I can't believe he just said that. However, now on the 19th time, I say to my sponsor, I can't believe he's saying that same story. And my sponsor's sponsor reached across past my sponsor and whacked me upside the head. He said, excuse me, he's not talking to you tonight. He's talking to the new person that apparently you don't know is in the room. It's like, oh, there's other people in AA. <laughs> oh, my. So anyway, this physical reaction that I get is what the book calls the phenomenon of craving. And the best way that I can describe this thing that the book calls the phenomenon of craving in my life is that it seems like whenever I drink booze, the more booze I drink, the thirstier I get. It happens with nothing else, just booze. An example of that, they were kind enough to give me this bottle, uh, this glass of water. And over the next uh, hour that I'm talking with you, I will probably drink at least this glass of water. I might drink about a half of another one of those glasses of water. But I can absolutely swear to you that once I finish this water, I am not going to go buy a case of water and lock myself in the hotel room. <laughs> there is no chance of that happening. Right? There's no chance that at 2 a.m. I'm going to be calling up Steve or Charlie or me soon. Oh, man, you got you to give me another case of water. Come on, I'll turn the pink slip on my car over. Come on. Right? There's no chance of that happening. But if that was the only thing that made me alcoholic, this bizarre physical reaction that I get, if that was the only thing that made me alcoholic, well then, just say no would have wiped out alcoholism, right? Early 80s, Nancy Reagan came out and said, just say no. I would have, and I imagine you would have gone, ha ha, <laughs> no, and just gone on and lived a happy, successful life just saying no. But I've got this other strange part of my relationship with alcohol, and that happens 
when I'm not drinking it. Of and by myself, if I don't drink for a day, a week, or a month, I seem to have this mind that is able to paint a picture that makes it okay to take another drink, no matter what the pain, humiliation, and suffering was a day, a week, or a month ago. And it never enters into the equation whether it was my pain and humiliation or your pain and humiliation. I could care less. But sooner or later, my mind is able to rationalize and justify my walk back to the next drink at all costs. So I can't drink successfully because of this strange physical reaction that I get, this craving. So I can't drink successfully, but I cannot oven by myself not drink successfully. I'm damned if I do, and I'm damned if I don't. It's the ultimate catch-22 we call alcoholism because I swear to you if I could do either one of those two things, either drink successfully or on my own not drink successfully, that's what I'd be doing. I'm going to harp on that physical feature a little bit more because it's bar none the one thing we all have in common. Because our stories are very, very different. If you're new or fairly new and somebody has said, stay here until you hear your story, you might be here a long, long time. (laughs) Because Alcoholics Anonymous is a huge, wide cross-section of society. Every race, creed, color, religion, good family, bad family, education, no education, all parts of the uh, earth we grew up in, we, we all come from different places, right? In fact, Alcoholics Anonymous is the only place where the bank president, the bank teller, and the bank robber are all in the same room. (laughs) And they all have a very different story about what just happened. (laughs) So our stories are different on that. But then on top of that, we drink differently than each other. We do. To illustrate that, let's imagine that we cracked open the back doors, we wheeled in this giant cart with all the kinds of booze we all like. If you're a top shelf drinker, we got it on there. There's some Remy Martin, some Cavassier, we got it. If you're a bottom shelf drinker, we got it. Mad Dog 2020 and everything in between. We wheeled in a giant cart. And if we all took a good four or five stiff drinks, stiff drinks, no umbrellas, no spritzers, this really good four or five stiff drinks, we would all be acting very differently. Over in this corner, we'd have the good time crowd. Ha, 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 hey, yeah, woo-hoo, ha, ha, add a little methamphetamine, talk a little faster, ha, ha, talk, 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 right, having a good time, right, the good time crowd, going all over the place, woo Over in this corner, we'd have the sobbers, woo In this corner, we'd have the fighters, always get drunk and fight, fight, fight. Over here, a bunch of us would be naked. <clears throat> would be visiting each corner trying to find a couple of friends to come over here with me. (laughs) So our stories are different on that level too, right? Over here, the good time crowd, lots of DUIs or DWIs, whatever you call it, right? Always, hey, come on, next party, come on, hey, whoa, somebody get to the bar for after hours party, come on. Always drinking and driving, got a lot of DUIs in the good time crowd. Right? The sobbing corner, no DUIs, they don't even leave the house. (laughs) Right? Late night drunk phone calls is about how bad they get. Oh, right? Or drunk texting, or God forbid these days, drunk Facebooking. Right? right? From the closet. Oh. The fighting corner, they always got probation and parole, right? All some sort of prison in there, right? Lots of violence in their story. Over here, a bunch of children show up by surprise. <laughs> So our stories are different on that level, too. But no matter what corner we're in, there's one thing we would all be doing. We'd all be back at the cart for more. That's the one thing, bar none, we would all be doing. So I set this relationship up with alcohol that I just described to you right from the get-go when I first started drinking. I started drinking much later than most people in AA. I was 11. It is, I mean... These days, there's 12-year-olds up there. They're on their third treatment center, for God's sake. We lived in Seattle. A typical morning for me would be I'd show up early for school, not for study hall or anything, but to meet my new friends at the very edge of the school property, loser's corner. Every school's got a loser's corner. We'd be sitting out there uh, uh, 
we would have the playground cocktail. Remember that? It was a, it's a jar full of whatever you could rip up out of the parents' liquor cabinet the night before. And that jar is scary because none of us have been to bartending school yet. So there's equal amounts of whiskey, vodka, cream, mint, right? All in that jar. There's green things floating around in there. You can imagine eight or nine of us, 11, 12-year-olds, choking that down, <coughs> handing that jar around. And, of course, it was the early 70s, so we're smoking that commercial pot. Anybody remember that stuff? Four-finger lids, $10 a bag, seeds and stems and the whole bit. And it was even before Ziploc baggies were invented, when it would just be a regular glad sandwich bag. And as you'd roll it up, there'd be like nine people spit on it, like, oh, man. <laughs> were you guys there, too? Yeah. So anyway, there in Seattle, by the time I'm 14, uh, I'm the neighborhood drunk. I'm the neighborhood pot dealer. I forgot to mention, but my father was a neighborhood Lutheran minister. He didn't find anything funny about this at all. My parents, really, really good people, and they saw something was happening to their son. It was obvious that something was happening to their son. I mean, by the time I'm 14, my hair is growing down onto my shoulders, in front of my bloodshot eyes. My vocabulary is, whoa, <laughs> whoa, whoa, right? That's my vocabulary. But they blamed my problems on people, place, and things. They didn't understand that I was alcoholic, right? They, if I don't understand what alcoholism is, then I will blame people, place, and things, just like the non-alcoholics. The non-alcoholics who don't understand it will always blame people, place, and things. They thought, if we can get him away from that damn group of kids he's hanging out with, things get better. They tried. If we can get him out of that damn public school system, things get better. They tried. But you see, I'm an alcoholic. My problems are not based upon people, place, and things. My problems are based upon my physical and mental relationship to alcohol. You see, if you change the people, place, and things in somebody's life like mine, all that happens is that I'm loaded with different people in different places, ruining different things. That's all that happens. So when I was about 18, my parents decided that Seattle was the problem. Get them out of Seattle, things get better. So they sent me 300, they sent me 300 miles away to Washington State University. I spent three years at that university on my parents' money, and in that three years, I got almost 10 credits. At any given time, my grade point average matched my blood alcohol content uh, about a .25. I did nothing at that school. By the time I was 22, this little story I'm about to tell you will let you know exactly where I stood with my family. Now, my father was Swedish, my mother is Icelandic, therefore I look like a polar bear. And I don't know whether this custom I'm about to tell you about is Scandinavian or whether it's Lutheran. I don't know. But at Christmas time, my parents wouldn't just send out Christmas cards to their friends and relatives. My parents would send out this big, long Christmas letter that said everything the family had been doing that year. When I was about 22, I got a hold of one of these letters that had been sent out the previous Christmas. And as I read it, it let me know exactly where I stood with my family. Now, the first paragraph talked about what my parents had been doing that year. Another impressive year, I'm sure. The next paragraph talked about what the Morris children had been doing that year, and that paragraph went something like this. Our oldest daughter, Christina, just graduated from Cornell University, University in Ithaca, New York, with a master's degree in human resources. She's now working for a large pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company in the Midwest. She traveled to Europe this summer. She saw this. She saw that. Her hobbies are this, this, and this. She's a very happy young woman. We, we are very proud of her. Our oldest son, Eric, just graduated from Western Washington State University with a degree in marketing. He's now working for a large advertising firm here in downtown Seattle. He loves to golf. He loves to travel. He's engaged to be married to this wonderful woman named Mary Lou, who works for a very small company here in Seattle named Microsoft. <laughs> it was small at one time, and they love to golf together. They love to travel together. He's a very happy young man. We are very proud of him. Our youngest son, Carl, just turned 22. <laughs> They were actually being very kind. It's about this same time, it's about this same time that a really, really bad night happened. It just, it, it really, it would take till breakfast to describe everything involved in this, so I like to just shorten it right up. A drug deal went really, really badly, and a bad night all happened, and it, it just went so badly that I joined the Navy. It really went that badly. 
what I'm about to tell you should make you really quite nervous if you care anything about the security of the United States. <laughs> But on my way into the Navy, I passed a potential test. It's called the ASVAP test. And this test that I took qualified me to become a nuclear engineer. <laughs> that should concern you, that the United States Navy has any type of system in place that would even maybe, possibly, or even remotely, allow somebody like me near anything nuclear. However, they made me take another test when I showed up at that base for boot camp and I could not pass that particular test and that test is called a urinalysis test is what it's called. <laughs> so remember I've been in boot camp for about uh, maybe 10 or 12 days maybe and in came the master at arms, this guy, you know, with military police is what he is and he came into the boot camp barracks and he had this clipboard. And they, about five or six names were on that clipboard. I knew my name would be on that clipboard. And five or six of us were taken out of the barracks and we were taken off the training side of the Great Lakes Naval Base over to the administrative side. And the other guys were taken into this one building. I was taken into a completely separate building, into the office of the commanding officer, officer of the whole Great Lakes Naval Training Station. Big, beautiful office. Big oak desk. Pictures of naval vessels on the wall. I stood in front of the man behind that desk had so much gold on his shoulders, blind you on a bad morning. And he asked me my name. I gave him my name. And this would have been the early 80s. So he, on this big oak desk, he had a, uh, a telephone with a speakerphone attachment on there. And on the speakerphone, he pushed the button on it. And into the speakerphone, he said, Walt, that's my father's name. By this time in 1984, my father had, would have been in the United States Navy active in reserve for 40 years. He'd been active in three wars, reserve the rest of the time. He's one of the highest ranking chaplains in the Pacific Northwest. This was an old World War II buddy of my father's. So this man says into this phone, Walt, out of consideration for our long-term friendship, I thought I'd ask you, what do you think? we should do with your son. Now, if you would have met, ever met my father, you would have, just by his body language and especially his voice, you knew he had a passion for living. You could sense it in his voice. You could tell that he viewed life as an extreme privilege and that he really, really loved the things that he had gotten to do in his life. You could sense it when you met him and especially in his voice. But there was another voice that would come out of that man. And that was a voice like somebody had just kicked him right below the belt. It was a voice of confusion, defeat, and just, and I'd heard that voice so many times. It was always when he was dealing with me. And he'd always accompany that voice with this look, and he'd tilt his head like. And that was the voice that came out of that speakerphone that morning. I heard my father's destroyed voice say, it's just none of my concern anymore. And then I heard the, that click and the dial tone, and as he just left that dial tone to go, and he, the man behind the desk just stared at me. If I could have just slithered out of that office underneath that carpet, I would have. That guy decided to, that man decided to keep me in the Navy anyway. Thank God for you guys. He took away that nuclear status thing. And a year and a half later, I'm a lower rank than when I first came in. <clears throat> It's kind of like this. I knew I was in the Navy. It was obvious. All I had to do was survey my surroundings. I saw that I was on a big gray ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. I was in a uniform. By God, I'm in the United States Navy. However, that ship would pull into a port, and I would leave that ship, and I'd take a drink, and I would totally forget that I'm in the United States Navy. And there's something else going on at this point in my life. At this point in my life, I'm 23, I'm 24, I'm 25 years old. And when I take a drink, I have no idea whether it's going to be three hours or three days until that drunk is over. And I got to tell you, it's a very strange feeling. After a three-day drunk, coming out of that three-day drunk, and I'm on a large pier in a foreign country, and at 6 a.m. going, <clears throat> There was a destroyer here the other day. <clears throat> A 
been in the Navy about two years. And it was a Monday morning, and again, I, I'm coming out of a three-day drunk. I'm late getting back to my ship on that Monday morning, and I'm driving my car that's held together by rubber bands down this long straightaway in the front of every naval base. There's a guard shack where a Marine stands duty. Under normal circumstances, you're supposed to slowly and politely pull up at this car, up at the guard shack, show him your military ID. He'll check the sticker on your car if everything's in order. He'll allow you to proceed onto the base. This particular morning, as I was driving my car into the base, I did what I always did when I'd come out of a three-day drunk, is I would save a pint. And I'd try to get half of that pint in me. I'd throw the other half a pint underneath the seat. And at noontime, I'd run off the, off the ship out to the car and finish off the other half a pint. It's my way of sliding into Tuesday, I guess. This particular morning, I guess I was paying more attention to getting that half a pint in me than where the car was going, and I, my eyes came into focus, and I saw the Marine had his head out of the guard shack, like, and I was wondering what he was so excited about until I looked down and saw I was still going 40 miles an hour. I yanked the wheel and tried to swerve, and I, my, the car hit this big cement median on the right-hand side and flipped over, and bang, right through that guard shack. I can still see that Marine doing this big dive out of there. He did a quick somersault, and he was right back up. Thank God those guys are in good shape. I mean, I'm just really happy about that. The Navy was very angry at me that morning. The Marine was all right. They were patching me up at the hospital for minor injuries, and they're reading new charges on me. And this is nothing significant or new in my life. New charges, that's just what happens in a guy's life like mine about every 90 days if you're living the way I'm living. So there's nothing new or significant about new charges. But the most significant thing that happened that morning is the Navy doctors prescribed this stuff called Anabuse for me. And they sent this prescription back to the ship's doctor. I was now under orders to show up at sick bay every single morning before quarters, and the corpsman will put this little white pill on my tongue and make me sit there for a half an hour to make sure it actually ingested in my system. Over the next seven to ten days, I started to experience the most cunning, baffling, and powerful side of this thing we call alcoholism, and that is I had no alcohol in my system, and I was literally going insane. See, what happens to me when you take alcohol away from me, and you do not give me specifically Alcoholics Anonymous. It's not you need to, when you take alcohol away from me, you need to give me something to replace. No, no, no. You have to give me one of two things. You either have to give me alcohol, or you have to give me specifically Alcoholics Anonymous. One of those two things has to be completely 100% active in my life, or I lose it. What happens to me when you take alcohol away from me, and you don't give me Alcoholics Anonymous, the best way I've ever heard it described is that I feel like a scream looking for a mouth. And I don't know how to tell you that. And you, the people that still care about me, if there's anybody left, always points at the things that are happening. That's what they define my alcoholism as. They all, they look at, look at that wrecked car. You flunked out of school again. You can't even get a job. You're pissing, pissing everybody off. You're arrested again, Carl. And they point at all those things. And I, I want to say, yes, I agree. I don't like the fact that that car's on fire. Really, I'm on your side. I didn't want that to happen. It's really a buzzkill right now. <laughs> But if you knew how I felt when I wasn't drinking, you wouldn't be asking me why I drink. And I remember counting those days on that abuse just... It's been four days and <clears throat> I'm on abuse. Now it's been six days and... I'm on anabuse. Now it's been eight days, six hours, and 15 minutes, and I'm on anabuse. And I started to look around that ship, the other men, they're talking behind my back. All 300 of them. <laughs> Have you ever felt that way in AA? <laughs> the only difference is that in AA, uh, we are talking behind your back. <laughs> it's not an illusion. We're really doing it. 
On the tenth day, I just snapped. I went AWOL from my ship. I locked myself in a little hotel room in downtown San Diego, the Plaza Hotel. It's on 4th and Broadway. It's still there. This would have been 1986. It was $13 a night back in 1986. I checked about six months ago. Uh, they rehabbed that whole area of San Diego. They didn't rehab too much on that Plaza Hotel because it's still just $19 a night to be at the Plaza Hotel. And I remember I remember sitting on the edge of the bed and I had this bottle of vodka and a shot glass on this rickety little end table. And as I stared at the bottle of vodka, I remembered that the Navy doctors had given me a very stern warning about drinking on top of the antibuse when they had prescribed it for me. They had said, son, you need to understand that if you drink on top of antibuse, you're going to get one of two reactions. One reaction is you will get violently ill. The other reaction is you might die. I remember looking at the bottle and I thought, <clears throat> well, I wonder which reaction I'm going to get. <laughs> I took one shot and nothing happened. Authority had lied to me again as far as I was concerned. I waited about two minutes just to make sure, and I took another shot. All of a sudden, I felt tingly in the face. So I looked in this cracked little mirror that was in this hotel room, and I was bright red, blotchy and purple in places. Hmm. Took another shot. All of a sudden, I could feel my heart going boom, boom, boom. Looked at my shirt. I was drenched in sweat, and then all of a sudden, I was like <gasps> hyperventilating. <gasps> We're doing all right so far. You guys are really sick if you think this is funny. <laughs> I actually have proof of that. You're all very nicely dressed, good-looking people. Seem to be somewhat in your right mind, but apparently not. And I've got proof of that you're not too well. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of years. I'm going to come back to this hotel room because important stuff happened in that hotel room. I'm going to skip ahead two years. Two years sober and Alcoholics Anonymous. My first, uh, my first sponsor and his sponsor, my first sponsor was a guy in the Navy and his sponsor, real sticklers about the ninth step. I know I'm skipping ahead. Who, who's, who am I going to tread on here on step nine? But anyway, I'm teasing. Go ahead. We, the, uh, one of the amends that I was unable to make while I was still in the Navy was my parents had paid for a bachelor's degree. Remember that? I didn't have one. I had two choices. I either had to go get I either had to pay them back every single nickel that they had paid for for it, or I had to go get what they had paid for in the first place. So that's how I, got, I wound up up in Los Angeles. I was in San Diego. That's where I got sober in the Navy. And then uh, I moved up to Los Angeles to go to school. And uh, I signed up to get this, take this telecommunications management bachelor's program. And in the first couple of uh, weeks of this uh, of, of, uh, of school, I, had, I was taking this uh, business presentation class like a speech class for giving business presentations. First couple of days of this class, the instructor was randomly pointing at students, throwing them up in front of the room, giving them a topic to talk on. And each student was supposed to talk for two to three minutes just on whatever topic the, the student, the instructor gave them. He was doing this just to see what he had to work with for the semester. And after about seven or eight students were thrown up there, he pointed at me. And I walked up to the front of the room, and the instructor in the back of the room shouted out, talk about a bizarre situation in your life. So I told them about drinking on top of antibuse. <laughs> they did not respond the way you guys did. They were like... <laughs> there were, though, a couple of guys in the back going, Woohoo! Right on, dude! Woohoo! <laughs> so anyway, I'm back in the hotel room. I'm red-faced. I'm hyperventilating. I'm sweating. And I took another shot. And up it came. My second sponsor was a man named Eddie Cochran, who passed away in 1999 with 47 years of sobriety. Really one of the pioneers of Southern California Alcoholics Anonymous, along with your Saturday night speaker, Clancy. I mean, literally, that's the way I view them, pioneers of Southern California Alcoholics Anonymous. And he called the next thing that happened to me projectile regurgitation. It's a new level of puking I was unfamiliar with. <laughs> Because we all know the levels of puking, right? That one, you know, you're just out there in the middle of a good drunk, and you get that little warning, right? Sour taste in the back of your throat. Maybe a little bit comes up in the mouth, but not too much, just a little bit. But only a little, and you, you can kind of go, mm. <laughs> And we all know we have between 30 and 60 seconds to find a bathroom if there happens to be one. If we're driving, we try to get the window down because we know that ruins the rest of the night in the car if we don't. Or if it's our friend's shoe tonight, that's just the way it goes. But here on the Anabuse, there was no warning. 
right? No, it was just ah! sort of a Linda Blair spray across the room. Thank God the Plaza Hotel is the type of hotel room where the toilet is in the same room with the bed. It's a design feature, I believe, maybe to make convicts feel more at home upon release. I'm not really sure. But I found the magic of drinking on top of Antibus, and that is that there's two things you've got to get active at the very same time if you're going to be successful at drinking on top of Antibus. You have to, number one, hang in there. You, ca you cannot half measure it when you're drinking on top of Antibus. You really need to be committed to this. And at the very same time, don't die. If you can put those two things together, go for it. I found that if I kept drinking and kept puking and kept drinking and kept puking for about an hour to an hour and a half, enough of the antibiotics would kick out of my system and I would quit throwing up and I would just be left with red face, hyperventilating and sweating, and I'm all right with that. <laughs> so I drank on top of antibiotics the last seven months of my drinking. There's no other way to describe this but desperation drinking. My second, my last drunk, I was left for dead in a motel parking lot in an area of San Diego called National City. Uh, three guys, I'd like to think it's three guys. I've been saying that for so long, I sure hope it was. Three guys just opened up my face and left me in a giant pool of blood, and I came to the, uh, a few hours later on an operating table. And because they had no idea, my jaw was broken, so I couldn't talk. They had no idea what combination of alcohol or drugs was in my system, so therefore they could not use anesthesia. That was a fun morning. My last night of drinking, I'm being let out of the San Diego jail, being transferred from civilian authorities back to military authorities. I'm in handcuffs, and there's lots of angry people around. You know those mornings, right? And, the neck, and your neck muscles aren't working well that day. And that morning, the officer deck put his arm up when they tried to bring me back to my ship, and the officer deck put his, put his arm up and said, wrong answer. Orders have already been processed on this loser. The orders are 90 days in the brig, bad conduct discharge, or treatment. And as I stood there in handcuffs, apparently some sort of option was thrown out on the table. And I do not remember thinking as I stood there in handcuffs, I don't remember thinking, oh God, you're so good to a bum like me and I just can't keep going this way. And look it, you've offered treatment. I don't remember thinking that. Nor do I remember, and it would have been more likely, but I don't remember feeling this way either, it would have been more likely that I would have thought, hey, if I just act like I want that treatment thing, maybe I can beat this rap too. That would have been more likely. But I don't remember that either. I now know that it wouldn't have mattered what I was thinking or feeling that morning because I was in handcuffs. And I don't know about your experience with handcuffs, but my experience throughout my life was always the same whenever handcuffs were involved. Whoever had me in handcuffs, never once did they ever turn to me and say, so what's your opinion on this matter? <laughs> right? When you're in handcuffs, you go where they say. And I was taken up to a military treatment center up in the north end of San Diego, and when the doors were locked behind me, that's when the handcuffs were taken off me. And that's what the society in which I live feels about how Carl Morris acts out there in the world without Alcoholics Anonymous, and rightfully so. So I'm in this treatment center. In the first couple of days of this treatment center, other men and women are coming from various ships based in commands from all over, literally all over the western United States and Hawaii, and they're uh, coming into this place over the next couple of days. In the first few days, they're doing medical checkups on us. They are doing, uh, they are doing, uh, uh, trying to get our files transferred from our from our commands or our ships, so that you know they have our file there. And they've got us in like a group therapy session. And the first couple of days, there was this assistant facilitator who was trying to conduct this group therapy session, and none of us are talking. We're just arms folded, looking down the ground, and he's running out of things to say. Right? He's describing this and this chart and that, and then he tried to get us to talk. Nobody's talking. We're just nothing. Somewhere in the middle of the third day, I think, this fellow named Paco raises his hand. He says, I'd like to say something. And this facilitator got really excited. Yes, Paco, what would you like to say? And Paco says, I hear that I'm supposed to be rigorously honest with you guys if I'm going to do this staying sober thing. And I want you guys to know that Paco is not my real name. Paco's just a name that I've always used since I was a young teenager whenever things look like trouble. And the other day when I got here, this really looked like trouble. <laughs> but I want to be honest and upfront with you. My name's not Paco. It's really Randy. Will you guys call me Randy from now on? We all look up and go, <clears throat> okay, <laughs> nice to meet you, Randy. 
But this assistant facilitator got really excited. Oh, my God! This is the first breakthrough of any honesty of any of you SOBs. Later that afternoon, afternoon, they gathered us all up again. They called on Paco. He walked up to the front of the room. They slapped a gold name tag on him that said Paco. I mean, Randy. It said Randy right on the gold name tag. And then we were all informed that whenever staff was not around, Randy's in charge. And Randy loved his new job. And we all hated Randy. On the seventh day in this place, they took us all to our first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. At least it was my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. All I know is we've been in this place seven days. And on the one M, over the 1MC, it's like an intercom system through the barracks. They said civilian closed, parking lot, 6 p.m. And so we're all about 35 of us are standing out there. And seven, five or six white vans pulled up. And five or six, seven of us into each van. And boom, out in town, each van went to a different meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous somewhere in the San Diego County area. And sure enough, the van I was in, Pulled up at a meeting, and if you have ever been at meetings in San Diego, the mil- you see the military. You know, we sit in the back of the meeting, and you guys started you guys started your meeting, and it was podium participation. Didn't know there were different kinds of meetings. Had no idea about that. All I know is a long string of people came up to a podium up front, and the first few people read stuff. And then the remaining 12 or 13 that came up there just got up there and started telling stories right off the cuff. No notes, no nothing, just, ah, 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 just telling stories. And as I listened to what the people were reading and what those subsequent people were, were talking about, I got this overwhelming feeling of, oh, my God, they know. They know. They know. Now, if you would have seen me sit in the back going, oh, and you, and you said to me, so what is it that they know that you think you know? I would have said, I don't know. But they know. And what was happening to me, this is really, this is what was happening to me in my first meeting. I didn't know it. But what was happening to me in that first meeting is what I truly believe Alcoholics Anonymous wants to have happen to somebody that is brand new. I was identifying. And I was identifying with two things. I was identifying with the way they told their stories about drinking. But it was strange. I'd heard drinking stories before. I'd lived drinking stories. I told drinking stories while living a drinking story, right? Heard a million of them in bars and crack houses all over the st- We'd tell drinking stories out there. But you were telling your stories about your drinking in a way, without even saying so, that you were free of it. Strange. But I knew that you were free of it. It was weird. The other thing that was even more important is that I identified with the way you described the way you felt when you were not drinking. I had never heard anybody talk about that. And you guys seemed to have a whole language. You acted like it was yesterday's news that you'd known this all along. I never could put any words to it. I didn't know how to say tell it to you. You guys just seemed to like right off the cuff talk about this strange, bizarre anxiety, this frustration, this separation. That you, I mean, you used all sorts of words. I remember this one guy that described this crazy way that his mind works right in the very first meeting. He got called on. He walked all the way to the front. He said one sentence and he sat down. He said, my name's Jack. I'm an alcoholic. My mind would have killed my body a long time ago except it needed it for transportation. And it, just, <sighs> so I identified right off the bat. Next night, they took us to another meeting. And I don't know what kind of meeting it was, but I, as, as much as I identified at the first meeting, I got equally as confused at the next meeting. Because everybody at this meeting was talking about something called a drug of choice. I don't hear it much anymore in A, but back in the 80s, man, they were just always throwing that term around. Drug of choice, drug of choice. I'm like, what? I'm sitting in the back going, was I supposed to be choosing out there? (laughs) Do they want me to choose now? What on earth are they talking about? So the next morning, I'm back at the treatment center. I asked the counselor who had been assigned to us. I go, Mary, last night in the meeting, they were talking about something called a drug of choice. What on earth do they mean by that? She said, Carl, let's play a game. Now, that worried me because I knew what she was saying. She was saying, pay attention. And that was difficult for me. I didn't know what was going on. I only now know now what was going on. But it was hard to pay attention for quite some time early on in treatment because 
when I had shown up and they did that medical checkup on me, they had found that my liver was extended, my pancreas was shutting down, I had extreme what they call alcoholic edema, where my skin was just soaked in alcohol. Apparently, drinking on top of antibuse for seven months does a little number on your internal organs. So they had salted my tail with these detox meds, right, just to make sure I don't throw the big seizure in the middle of the therapy session and disturb everybody's day. Everybody would freak out, and it kind of just interrupts the process of everything, apparently. So they salt your tail with these things. And if you've ever been on those things, you know what I'm talking about. Your field of vision is just fine about like this. But there's dancing squiggly things over here. And when you look to see what it is now, it's over here. And so you're doing a lot of... And it's hard to pay attention. So when she said, Carl, let's play a game, I went, okay. And she said, imagine this, Carl. Imagine I walked in this room and I had a tray, she said. And on that tray, I had a bottle of Jack Daniels, an ounce of cocaine, and an ounce of tie sticks. Which one would you take? I started to drool immediately, right out the side of my mouth. Oh, 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 I take them all. I take them all. And she started to snap her fingers. Settle down, Carl. Settle down. You can't have them all. Play the game. Which one would you take? And I thought for a second. I said, well... I guess if I can only have one, Mary, I, I guess I'd take the ounce of cocaine. She said, oh, maybe cocaine is your drug of choice. Do you understand now? And I said, no. <laughs> no, I, I don't understand. She goes, what's the problem? I said, well, Mary, the only reason I take the ounce of cocaine over the other two is, well, I take that ounce of cocaine, I get the hell out of here, and I'd sell two eight balls. I would now have enough money for a quarter pound of tie sticks and a case of Jack Daniels. That's what I would do. Now, the only reason I bring that up is to bring up a very important aspect of Alcoholics Anonymous, if you're new or fairly new, and that's sobriety days. First of all, it's very, very important to have one. Alcoholics Anonymous just makes a lot more sense when you have a sobriety date. It really does. And there's only one sobriety date. I, I bet you there's all sorts of people that work with new people. Maybe you run across this scenario every once in a while, like I went do in L.A., but not very often, but every once in a while. But I like to, when I see somebody, hey, good to see you. How long do you got? And every once in a while, not often, but every once in a while I get this. Well, my drinking sobriety date is January 4th. My pot clean date is May 3rd. Oh, I blew my methamphetamine date last night. I was in Walmart all night long. It's like... Funniest thing I ever heard about sobriety date, same scenario. I saw this guy around my home group for a while, went up to him, hey, good to see you. How long do you got? And he said, well, I had 90 days, but I drank last night. So now I have 89 days. <laughs> I almost had to call my sponsor to check up on that. <laughs> I think that kind of falls into the same category as being down in Mexico, looking at the tequila, wondering, would that affect my U.S. sobriety date? Yes. <laughs> sobriety dates are international. Just a little information for the new guy. So anyway, after 45 days and let us all out of this place, uh, that's just what the orders were. And on the Wednesday before the Friday, they get, put us all into this room. And the side door opened up, and the biggest, meanest counselor in this place walked in, and he's a Marine. And that day, he's in his full-dress uniform. And i got to tell you, a Marine in his full-dress uniform is a very impressive, very intimidating sight. And when he walked in in that full-dress uniform, the whole room went, <gasps> just went dead silent. And he walked up to this lectern or a podium that was in front of the room, and he grabbed both sides, he leaned over, and he just stared at us. He didn't speak for, it seemed like, minutes. It was probably ten seconds. But he panned the room and stared at us. And then he finally spoke. He said, you 35 have been through one of the finest treatment centers in the world for alcoholism and drug addiction. This treatment center has been here for many, many years. And over the years, our statistics have shown us that out of you 35, only one of you will stay continuously sober from this day forward. Many of you will die, go insane, wind up in prison. Nice little exit pep talk, don't you think? <laughs> then he said, many of you relapse once, twice, maybe 20 times, and then make it back into long-term sobriety. But according to this treatment center statistics, only one of you 
will stay continuously sober from this day forward. If you thought it was quiet before that, you could have heard a pin drop now. The only thing you could hear was me going, shh. Because I knew if only one of us was going to make it, it was not going to be me. We all knew who it was going to be. It's going to be Randy over here, guaranteed. He's like the poster boy of the treatment center by now. So on this Friday afternoon, they're letting us all out, back to our ships, basing commands in various different ways. But there was about four or five of us that were instructed to wait on the front doorsteps of the treatment center because we had been arrested in vehicles the night before we were thrown into this place. So we were told to wait for our cars that had been in an impound lot for the last 45 days. So I'm standing with four other guys, and we're looking at each other. And, hmm, hmm, you feel treated? I don't know. What do you feel? Hmm. All of a sudden, one of the guys I'm standing with points to this car that's coming across the parking lot, and he goes, is that Randy in that car? Yeah. Sure enough. One of the other guys says, he's drinking already. Sure enough, Randy's got himself a bottle. He's polishing it off. He rolls right in front of us, and he throws the empty right out the window, right at us. Crash! We look up. He gives us all the finger, and he drives right off. <laughs> I guess his name was Paco again. I don't know. <laughs> Next thing that I remember of that day, it showed up at a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, a 6 o'clock gong show meeting in Pacific Beach. So the truth about my life is I was 45 days without a drink. I had a lot of information, and I was physically feeling better than I had felt since I'd been a young teenager. But there had been no spiritual experience, spiritual awakening, or even a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. And what was even more dangerous than that is I did not know I needed one. I didn't understand that other than the fact that I have this third relationship with alcohol that I didn't, I couldn't even have described it to you until I was like 13 years sober. But I didn't know the precarious situation that I was really sitting in, in that very first meeting, fresh out of treatment, with 45 days, physically feeling better, and information. I did not know that I was suffering from this spiritual malady, as we call it here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what that was really all about. I have a third relationship with alcohol. And it's spiritual. My spirit is connected to alcohol in a way that is not connected to nothing else on this planet. And I could not have described this to you until I was 13 years sober. And I have to tell you this story, which allowed me to see exactly what that was about for me. Don't know about it, whether it's for you. In the year 2000, my mother called me up and said, Carl, your brother and his wife and kids are in the south of France for the summer. Let's go visit them. And I'm, yeah, absolutely. And she said, oh, and by the way, uh, let's, let's go to Iceland for a week, too. We'll go see the family farm. There's this museum that they built for your great aunt. We'll go see that. And I, I'm in. I'm in. Absolutely. And so we went to Iceland and had a spectacular time. Uh, Life-changing, really. I've been back to Iceland like six times since the year 2000. But the real point of this story happened in the south of France. So we're down there visiting my brother, and he's staying at this beautiful place. Uh, remember Microsoft? <clears throat> no resentment for me here, right? And so we're staying at this beautiful, beautiful place. And one of the, and one of the nights, my brother goes, hey, 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 uh, I'm treating, and Carl, you're driving. We're going to go out for a 13-course French meal. We'll have the nannies watch the children, and us four will go. My mom, my brother, his wife. And so I drove, and we went to this spectacular castle in the French countryside, and the courtyard was a, a restaurant. And we were going to have a 13-course French meal. If you've never had a 13-course French meal, what they do is they bring a tiny little bit of food 13 times. That's what they do. <laughs> and with each one of these tiny little bits of food, they bring you an even smaller, embarrassingly small, tiny little glass of wine. And my brother and his wife uh, were trying to, my mom had just a little bit, uh, my brother and his wife were having a good time, and they recognize a good drinking opportunity. They're not alcoholic, but they enjoy alcohol, and they're trying, if they liked one, they would get to, you know, have another one of those, and if they didn't, they, you know, and the waiter was telling this, each little glass of wine, the waiter would tell a story about the vineyard that that came from, the family who owned the vineyard, and the history behind this family. All very interesting stuff. I was trying all the Diet Cokes of the region, and so I kept asking the waiter, no story about this? No, no, monsieur. Uh, right? So like I said, my brother and his wife are having a good time. And 
But my mother, after two tiny little glasses of wine, says to the waiter, no more for me, she says. And I go, and I've known that. I've known my mom. She, like, she has like two drinks a year and never finishes them. You know, she just, and I go, mom, come on, I'm driving. For God's sake, have a little more. And she goes, no, 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 Carl, I don't like the way it makes me feel. <laughs> All right, if I were smart, I'd just leave it alone and carry on. But, but this, the way she said it this time just really piqued my interest. And I go, how does it make you feel, Mom? And she goes, well, well, Carl, like you had said earlier, I'm having a once-in-a-lifetime experience sitting in this beautiful courtyard looking at the spectacular colors of the French countryside at sunset. The string quartet is just, oh, it's rattling my bones, Carl. I just love that. And I'm here talking with three of the people I love the most in the world. And if I were to drink a little bit too much alcohol, the colors become blurry and dull. The music starts to sound shallow and off in the distance. And I have a hard time keeping a conversation going with you. Do you get that? That is fundamentally the exact opposite to relate to a relationship to alcohol than I have. Because what she's saying is of and by herself, she sees the colors of life. She hears the music and she can connect with God's other kids. She adds a little alcohol. It all gets dull, blurry, and sloppy. Me, of and by myself, I cannot see the colors of life. I cannot hear the music, and you're goddamn boring. <laughs> you are. <laughs> I get three or four drinks in me and <laughs> look at those oh, look at brilliant oh. listen to that music oh I'll tell you where that cello was made whether I know or not I can make up the name of a German village on the spot and you become very interesting but not as interesting as me. <laughs> I remember I had this experience of, ah, so that's why you won't sell your soul for a drink. You, oh. So then I look at my brother and his wife, and they're over there having a good time. <laughs> and I go, do you feel that way? You, does it sort of get blurry and sloppy? And he goes, yeah, 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 but we like it blurry and we like to escape. Our lives are kind of tough. You know, we like to escape. And I go, oh, you're escaping. I'm trying just to join. And you're escaping. Oh, completely different. Completely different. I'm convinced that's what Alcoholics Anonymous is designed to do. It's designed to get, let me see the colors of life, to hear the music of life, and connect with God's other kids without a drink. And if I don't get that in my life, I'm not going to stay. I have to somehow, some way, find that here in Alcoholics Anonymous. If I find that, that renders the... I am no longer susceptible to the first drink. If I find this joy, this love for life in Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm no longer susceptible to the first drink. And if I do not take the first drink, the fact that I have an allergy to it is a moot point. Right? So it, that's why the book says when we straighten out spiritually, then we straighten out physically and mentally. So I'm sitting in the back of that meeting in San Diego. One guy that night found me in the back, came up to me and said, hey, never seen you here before. What are you doing? I didn't think quick enough to lie to him because I swear to you, I swear to you, if I could have, if I would have thought for one more second, I would have lied to him. And I accidentally told him the truth. And I said, uh, 
I said, I just got out of a Navy treatment center a couple hours ago. I don't know what I'm doing. This guy's eyes went bing, big smile went across his face. At the break of the meeting, he's like fighting his friends up. He's mine, he's mine, I got him, mine, mine, get away from me. I didn't know you marked your newcomers in here, right? But there was something else going on in this guy's life that particular Friday night that made him especially glad to meet me. This guy's girlfriend had left him the night before for one of his friends in his home group. So he was wondering what he was going to do with that weekend. Homicide, suicide, get loaded or grab this newcomer. He's like all over me all weekend. We went to like 18 meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and this guy was insane over this woman, flat out insane. In between this barrage of meetings he took me to, he would throw me in the passenger side of his car. He'd start driving and he'd start yelling. He wouldn't even look at the road. He had like one of those AA radar cars that just made it to the next meeting, right? And he'd just be yelling at me, you got to go to me, you got to read the book, you got to get his sponsor, damn her, got to go to me, you got to read the book, damn her. And I'm like, I didn't know it, but I was getting a very early introduction to your typical AA relationship breakup is what I was getting. But I'm so very glad that that guy, that night, in his pain, was a guy in Alcoholics Anonymous who had done the work of Alcoholics Anonymous, had taken the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, and therefore he understood that the solution to his pain was out of self, out of self, out of self. I am so glad that that guy, that night, in his pain, was not at home whining into his sponsor's answer machine. If you're younger than 30 years old, an answer machine is this box that sits on... right. So glad he was not at home whining into his sponsor's answer machine. Where are you? Call me. Fix me. Give me a magical answer. I'm so glad he was out dragging my sorry butt. So many meetings in the same area of town with that guy. I learned something really valuable about how we go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, especially when we're new. I saw other people going to multiple meetings over that weekend. I didn't see anybody else doing 18 meetings, just me and that guy. But I saw other people that were at two or three meetings over that weekend. And what I learned about how we go to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm going to correlate it to a football team. Now, a football team is out there on the field for one reason and one reason only, to win the game. And how do they win that game? They huddle up, they make a plan, and they do one play. Then they huddle up again, they make another plan, and they do one play. That's exactly what we do here in Alcoholics Anonymous, and the game around here is one day without a drink, you're a big winner. And how do we do that one day? We run in here and we huddle up. Go remember, we're bodily and mentally different from our fellows. Break! We go out there and we try a little of this and we try a little of that. After that weekend, I got back to the ship, and one other sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous was waiting for me. His name was Bob W. He was 14 months sober, and he became my first sponsor even before I asked him. He could care less whether I wanted him to be my, him to be my sponsor or not. He, he was trying to save his own life, and he was just all over me. He, it was kind of a captive audience because I would have to jump off the ship to get away from him. I'm really, really grateful for this guy. We were the blind leading the blind. In my first two years of, of, of sobriety, I was a nomad in Alcoholics Anonymous. Our ship went up and down the West Coast and up into Alaska and down to South America and out to Hawaii. And he and I would go to meetings wherever we, we could when, when we get off the ship. And when the ship was out at sea, he, would, he made me meet him in the aft end of the ship, way down in this little battery shop in this little, little room at the bottom of the engine room. I remember the very first night that I met him... Uh, down there. He had that blue book with him, right? And he tossed it down the table. He goes, I've been hounding about it for weeks or months. Have you read it? And I said, like, well, yeah, yeah. There's like how it works. We antagonist some, <laughs> some doctor with an opinion about something. Now remember, he was only 14 months sober. He didn't know what he was doing. But he opened up the book and he started to read. And when he was tired, I would read. And I really look at it as Alcoholics Anonymous in its purest form, the blind leading the blind, two guys trying to have an experience with the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we didn't even know what that experience would be. But it happened. 
He died three years ago. He was only 47 years old. He was younger than I was. But you know what? He still had 14 more months than me. The other thing that I learned while with Bob is that when we had the, the when I went through the steps the first time in that book, I got what is described in the back of the book under spirit, the appendices spiritual experience as it's described as a personality change sufficient to bring about recovery from alcoholism. But I was not going to get the real gift of Alcoholics Anonymous until I ever so feebly tried to do with someone else what he had done with me. I also learned that we have a responsibility to stay in our home groups, to take our seats, and do our part in Alcoholics Anonymous because there's this magic that separates us from every other spiritual movement that's ever hit the planet. And that is one alcoholic sharing with another alcoholic. Something happens that happens nowhere else. And we can affect each other like no one else can. So we got to stay here. How I learned that, again, I just like love to tell stories. How I learned about this magic of one alcoholic can affect another one. As I said, my first sponsor, Bob, and I would often split, uh, would often go to, we'd always go to meetings whenever the ship pulled in, but we would sometimes split a hotel room, right, to get off that ship. And this time we're in Victoria, British Columbia, and we split a hotel room at the Strathcona Hotel. And we went out to the AA clubhouse, went to the meeting, and after the meeting was over, Bob said, uh, you know, Carl, I'm not feeling very well. I don't know what's up, but I'm going to go back to the hotel room. I stayed out with the AAers, uh, maybe went out to coffee, maybe another meeting, I don't remember. But an hour and a half, two hours later, I come back to the hotel room. Well, a Bob, on his way back to the hotel room, had found this other guy from our ship named Blair. And he'd found him in the gutter. I mean, Blair's got puke on him. He's got crap on him from the streets. And he's been on a two-day drunk. And Bob has him on my bed. <clears throat> he's propped up against the headboard with like an end table and a chair and a pillow. And Bob is there reading the big book to Blair. <clears throat> we are more than 100. And I look at this scene. I go, it's ridiculous. Blair's like, blah, <clears throat> Right? He can't hear a thing, but Bob is there reading. I think it's ridiculous, but I throw, I come in, I throw my 10 cents in, and then, then we carry Blair back to the ship to make sure he's safe, get him into his rack, and he's all right. So last we hear of Blair for weeks. We're back in Port in San Diego a, a, a number of weeks later, and I'm in my rack at 3 a.m., and all of a sudden, wake up, wake up. I'm like, whoa, 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 what? And it's Bob. He goes, Carl, get up. Blair's on the Coronado Bridge. We gotta go get him. Apparently, over the last few weeks, Blair has tried to drink. He's tried not to drink. He's tried to drink. He's tried not. He's at the jumping off place, right? He's up on the Coronado Bridge. And I don't know if you know about, enough about the Coronado Bridge, but it's a very popular suicide spot. Back in the 80s and 90s, before cell phones, they had suicide hotline phones about every 100 yards. Now they just give you a cell phone number. <clears throat> but anyway, they're hoping that you might call before you, well, they're hoping you call before while your feet are still on the bridge, apparently. And Blair had called the suicide hotline up at the top of the Coronado Bridge. And this is what Blair was telling the very well-meaning, highly educated suicide hotline counselor. Blair was saying, I will only talk to Bob W. <laughs> the suicide hotline counselor was saying, who's Bob W? Blair was saying, it's anonymous. <clears throat> So that counselor went and got another well-meaning, her boss went and got uh, another well-meaning, highly qualified suicide hotline counselor, and they got both got on the phone. They started to do the good cop, bad cop, firing questions, confuse him, and they found out he's from the Navy and what should he's from. Right? They confused him enough to get that out of him. So they got called down to the quarter deck of our ship at 3 a.m. in the morning and take a stab in the dark. Is there a Bob W. on that ship? Now, my first sponsor, Bob, would guard your anonymity at the level of that ship, but he did not guard his own so he could be of service at any time. So the guy who answered the phone said, yeah, 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 Mr. Twelve Steps, we know all about him. So they go down and get Bob, and then Bob, come on, Carl, wake up, wake up. So we get into Bob's car, and we're driving down to the Coronado Bridge, and Bob looks at me and goes, Carl, get the big book out of the glove box. Bone up on working with others. Like, <clears throat> all right. <clears throat> He looks at me and laughs. He goes, oh, forget it. We're going to wing it tonight. So we get down to the base of the Coronado Bridge, and everything that San Diego County has available for a situation like this is there. The fire department is there. The paramedics are there. The police department is there. The on-duty psychologist is there. 
And we walk up on this scene, and the fireman who seems to be in charge looks over as we walk up and goes, is one of you Bob W? <laughs> Bob goes, yeah, yeah, that's me. Fireman goes, I don't know what you're going to do. We've been talking to him for hours, but go ahead. Here you go. Hands him this little speakerphone contraption. And Bob says, Blair? And you can hear on the other end, Bob, is that you? And Bob says, yes, Blair, it's me. Now get the hell down from that bridge. And you hear, okay. <laughs> one alcoholic can affect another alcoholic like no one else can. Don't forget that. We need to show up. I've got about seven more minutes. I'm going to try to squeeze in two things here. Really, I can sum up everything that's happened to me in my 27 years of sobriety in a couple of things here. Uh, in 1998, uh, my, I was asked to come down and do what I'm doing right now down in Nogales, Arizona. And before I left, and this is back before everybody had a cell phone, right? When everybody carried those pagers. Remember those pagers? Nobody still has a pager, do they? Right? So anyway, I, before I left, I think, you know, there's these big blackout areas where the pagers wouldn't work. Before I left, I called my mother and I go, Mom, if you try to page me this weekend, don't get worried if I don't call you right back because I'm going to be in Nogales, Arizona. The pager might not be working. Right? I already worried my mother enough over the enough years. Don't need her to worry when I'm sober. She goes, oh, you need to get a hold of Don and Leona. They live right near there. And I go, uh, remind me who they, oh, she goes, oh, that's right. You haven't seen them since you were like nine years old, Carl. I guess you wouldn't remember. Oh, that, yeah. But Don was the best man of your father's in my wedding. They're lifelong friends. They, he, they would love to see you. So I go, okay, mom, absolutely. So I call up Don. I go, Don, this is Carl Morris. I'm going to be, uh, just a little bit south of you. I'd love to get together for some coffee or something Saturday at noon. He goes, oh, I, I hear you love to golf. Bring your golf clubs. Now that surprised me. I go, well, yes, that's true. I'm a golf whore. I'll golf with anybody at any time for any reason. I don't even need to know your name. I'll golf with you. But I, how does he know that? I brought my clubs, and on Saturday morning, I took off from the conference, and I drove up about 15 miles up the freeway, met him at his golf, golf, uh, his golf club, and we started to walk along. And he, and the more we talked, the more confused I got, because he started to give me, he started to ask me very pertinent, very specific questions about my life. He knew what school I had graduated from, what degree I had, what uh, com companies I'd been with, what these recovery homes I'm involved. He just knew everything about my life. And by the fourth fall, I go, Don, I'm really confused here. I haven't seen you since I was nine years old. And you seem to know everything about my life. How on earth is that? He goes, oh, Carl, that's easy. Before your father passed away two years ago, you couldn't shut him up. He would go on and on. It was irritating sometimes, Carl, but he would go on. He just boasted about everything you were doing in your life. Now, that was nice to hear, but it wasn't It wasn't news because because of the, you told me do not procrastinate reestablishing a relationship with your father, Carl, and how you are going to do that, Carl, is you're going to quit trying to get him to understand you. It's your job to understand him. And you act that way every single time you talk to him. And because I didn't procrastinate on that, I was able to have a relationship with my father before he passed away. That was so, but it was, so it wasn't news, but it was really nice to hear from a lifelong friend. But the second reason I couldn't even golf anymore. He said, Besides, Carl, every Christmas I get the letter. I'm like, yes, I finally got in that thing. <laughs> when I was uh, 17 years sober, I got married. And we had two beautiful, beautiful kids. The marriage did not work out. I know you've never heard of that in AA. But, but you know what? We've got these two beautiful kids that we both love so much. Right. And she's a good mother. She is a good, good mother. And we have tried our best to be good co-parents. And we're doing a pretty darn good job of it. But man, something, something cracked in me when Matt, their names are Madison and Ryan. Madison just turned 10. Ryan is seven. And man, there's something inside of me that cracked when she was born and, and when he was born. And oh, a little, little piece of trivia. My sobriety date is January 21st, 1987. My son's birthday is January 21st, 2007. On my 20th AA birthday. It's like, oh. Anyway. This level of love for another human being, I did not know that existed until I had kids. I mean, it's like I met who I would die for. 
I know in the military, when I raised my hand, I said I would do it. I was hoping it was not going to come to that. I really was. <laughs> but really, if, if it's, it, it's like I, I mean, here's an example. Like if Ralph or Char, Ralph and Charlie and I or, or John back there, if we were, if we were out at Starbucks this weekend and some guy comes in wielding a gun saying, one of you's going to go, I would go, well, have you met Ralph? Have you met Charlie? Have you met hosted John? All right? But if I were with my kids, I would dive right without even a thought. Without even a thought. I would never trade my kids for the first drink. Never in a million years. But I'm alcoholic. I know what it means to be alcoholic. Although I would never trade them for the first drink, I would trade them for the second drink like that. So there is nothing that is more important than Carl being in the center of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why I love weekends like this. I get to sit the whole rest of the weekend right there with you and just absorb everything that these brilliant other members of Alcoholics Anonymous have to say this weekend. Do not miss it. Get up for the 9 a.m. one. Don't sleep in. Katie and Ralph are the two 9 a.m.s, right? You don't want to miss that. Come join Be With Us this weekend. It's spectacular. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.